And we are back for another group of indicator plants of BC. This time, group number three, we have some wet ones. So these are plants that I think except for one, they all have a wet soil moisture regime. These are the plants that you're gonna find in really damp places. And what do we have this time? So we've got a few different groups, a few different ones that you're gonna to have to distinguish between. We've got your upright and leafies. You've got your low plants with white flowers. So many low plants with white flowers in this course. And then we've also got the great and terrible skunk cabbage. That's the one that you're unlikely to confuse with any others. Before we get into the plants though, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about leaves because we know how to distinguish between different types of leaves. It's going to make it so much easier to talk about things for this week and for the rest of the course. Now remember back when we talked about the ferns, we said that there was something called pinnation or pinnate leaves. And those were the ones that looked like a feather. So with a pinnate leaf, a pinnate compound leaf, you know, whatever, you've got a central axis, and then you've got little sub things like veins or leaflets, whatever they may be, coming off in succession like this, kind of like the rungs of a ladder pointing up. This is, so that's pinnate leaves, the ones that look like a feather. That's opposed to palmate leaves. Now, Look at that worm, palmate. What does it make you think of? It makes you think of the palm in your hand. And that's what this is describing. That's describing leaves that look a little bit like your hand. And what we have with a palmate leaf is you have a central point and then you have the veins extending out from there. And this could be the veins, the lobes of the leaf, the little leaflets, whatever they might be. They extend out from a central point and end up looking vaguely like a hand. And then finally, you've got your, this one is probably not quite as common as some of the others, but you have your parallel veins, your parallel arrangements for the leaf. And so with this one, you have all the veins starting at one spot on the bottom, and they extend upwards, and then they'll end somewhere at the top. They might end somewhere on the edges, or they might converge on a point at the very tippy top there. But basically what this makes the leaf look like, it makes it look really stripy. It's got all these longitudinal stripes that appear when you can see the veins there. And we have lot, and why I want to point this out now is we have lots and lots of parallel veined leaves coming up this week. So that's leaves. First of all, the thing that you're not likely to confuse with anything else, the great and terrible skunk cabbage. So this is a super unique looking plant. You find this one in the forest in really muddy areas. This has got a it's really, really likes wet, damp spots. But you don't find it so much in wet areas like bogs because it still wants that rich soil. Bogs are really poor soils. The skunk cabbage likes to be in damp forests because you still get some rich soil. And check out this photo on the left here. Compared to this person, that is not a that's not a forest elf. That's a normal sized human being. And you can see how big the leaf of the skunk cabbage is compared to her. So this is, I think, the biggest leaf of any plant that we're going to talk about in the course. So if you see an enormous leaf on the ground when you're walking around through the forest, you know, start thinking about your skunk cabbage. But it looks sort of like a really unique plant as well because check out the flower, check out the reproductive structure in this guy. So the flowers occur in this... Um, structure here called a spadix and then you've got yeah spadix and then you've got the spathe which is this big kind of petally looking leafy thing that goes around the outside there and so it's this really unique looking flower and the name uh chitin in the genus name lysochitin actually means armor i think from greek and that's referring to the spathe which is around the spadix there. It's like the spadix's armor. Um, why is it called skunk cabbage? Because it smells like a skunk. You're walking along and in the woods and you suddenly have this really strong skunk smell. You know, it might actually be a skunk. It might just be some skunk cabbage as well. So kind of a smelly old plant. All right, that's an easy one to tell. 
now we're down to some of our low with white flower herbaceous plants here. And we're going to start off with another cabbage-y thing, deer cabbage, Phoria cristigali. By the way, just a heads up, none of these are actually cabbages. That's just a super fun name. <clears throat> so also has a wet soil and moisture regime. This one you find in poorer soils, so that you're going to find it in some slightly different places than the skunk cabbage we just talked about. But this is a very different looking plant compared to the skunk compared to the skunk cabbage that we just looked at. So check out the leaves here. They've got this uh, vaguely heart shape. So notice how they come in at the top and then they wrap around and in at the top again. <clears throat> and so that's a that's a shape that we call chordate if you're being super technical and botanical, but normal people just call that heart. A little closer look at those leaves. Um, another really distinctive feature about them is that they've got kind of these scallops around the outside. So you can see that in this photo on the right. They're not really serrated because serrations you think of as being really sh sharp and spiky. It's more like imagine one of your grandmother's tea doilies, which is all fancy around the outside. It's just kind of scalloped and rounded. It looks like, it looks like an arts and crafts project. So kind of a neat looking leaf like that. And this photo gives you a better view of how it comes in at the top as well. And compared to some of the other plants that we're going to look at, it's actually a very, very round leaf. It's almost shaped like a kidney bean, more so than a heart, actually. So kind of this kidney bean, vaguely heart-shaped, very rounded leaf scalloped around the outside. And look at the veins. What kind of, what kind of venation is that? What kind of veins are that? That's your palmate venation. So palmate veins extend out from a central point. And the flowers, they've got kind of these big, cool, chunky looking flowers. Yeah, so the flowers, five petals drooping around the outside. The flowers themselves, look at the petals. They almost have like the scallopy pattern around the outside of themselves too. It kind of looks like somebody took some, made them out of construction paper and cut them really roughly with a pair of scissors or even tore them up. And then they've got that very distinctive looking um, yellow, uh, yellow stigma in the middle. Yeah, so yeah, kind of a neat looking flower there, standing up on that big erect green stalk. Next up, false lily of the valley, Myanthemum dilatatum. Yeah, so another loves wet areas, loves rich areas. You find this one, if I'm going for a hike, you know, you find this one in a lot of similar places as the skunk cabbage, although it will tend to like slightly drier spots. So imagine you're going along the forest and you've got this big depression in the ground where water likes to collect. You might find your skunk cabbage in there. And then you might find your false lily of the valley in the areas just kind of around that, you know, not quite in the depression itself. But this plant tends to form these, it's really low to the ground. It just looks like a bunch of little leaves sitting on the ground and it tends to form these big mats. It spreads by rhizomes underground and it tends to just cover forest floors, really common cover plants in the forests around the Pacific, around uh, Vancouver here. So have a look at the leaves. What kind of veins do we see on the leaves here? That is our parallel venation that we just looked at. So the veins start at a point back here and then they extend out and they kind of end at a point on the end there, but they're not touching in the middle. That's what we call parallel venation. It's not parallel in a true mathematical sense of the word, but it's parallel in the botanical sense of the word. So there you go. And this is another one of those heart-shaped leaves. So a little bit, yeah, so kind of like the deer cabbage that we just looked at. Um, notice, compared to the deer cabbage, the deer cabbage was very round at the end. False lily of the valley has more of a distinctive point. So it's pointed at the end, but at, at the same time, it comes in wide, and then it extends in at the back of these two lobes. So it gives it that heart shape. And dilatatum, so this is a, the scientific name, myanthemum dilatatum. Dilatatum comes from either Greek or Latin, and it means wide. And so it's kind of this wide-looking leaf, kind of fat and very vaguely oval to circular in shape. Okay, so some of the, some of the berries on this guy now. 
Um, yeah, on the left here, these are some of the berries when they're a little bit newer. They tend to be kind of green with all these speckles. And then as you go on, and yeah, they're really cool actually. You know, they look like fancy little marbles. Like if you go into your your fancy rich friend's house, they might just have like a bowl of fancy beads or something. Kind of looks like something you'd see in that. And then as the season goes on, then they ripen up more and they turn red like this. And they occur in these clusters here. Next up, Clintonia uniflora, Queen's Cup. And this is one of those scientific names that I love because it tells you exactly what to look for. Uniflora means single flowered, and this is a really distinctive plant because it only produces a single flower or a single fruit. You can see a flower on the right hand photo there and the fruit on the left hand photo here sitting on that erect stalk. But this photo also gives a better look at some of the leaves. Now this is a really beautiful little plant when you find in the forest. It almost looks like somebody's ornamental plant that, you know, went wild. But it only produces two or three little leaves. They're a really elongated shape like this. And they've got, this is another one that has that par those parallel veins but it's really hard to see them. It just looks like a really smooth little leaf. You can kind of see in the right-hand photo here, maybe the veins a little bit better, but they're not nearly as distinctive as something like the false lily of the valley that we just looked at. So let's have a closer look at that flower right now. Um, it's a pretty small little thing. So th those leaves, when you find them in the forest, may be about the size of you know, they're kind of the vague shape and proportions of a, a foot, like a child's foot. And then you, yeah, and then they produce these little white flowers on top of that. And so, yeah, um, six petals, few little stamens poking around the outside, little stigma in the middle there. Yeah, they're just these delicate, beautiful little flowers. And having a look at the fruit here. So the fruits produce, it produces the, a single berry on an erect stalk like this. Very, very unique looking plant because it's not every plant that produces a single berry, just a single fruit like that. It's a super, super dark indigo color. And I think it was actually used at one point to produce dyes. So uh, kind of a double check me on that, but very deep colored berry there. And time for our vanilla leaf, uh, <clears throat> Aeclis triphylla. Just like the, you know, just like our, just like the Queen's Cup we were looking at a minute ago. Cool scientific name because it tells you what to look for right there in the name. Triphylla means three-leaved, and this is a really distinctive looking plant because it's got these three kind of funny looking leaves there. Kind of like the false lily of the valley, um, this is one that will tend to form these mats. You can see it's got this huge mat of vanilla leaf in this photo here. So it spreads and reproduces under down, underground by rhizomes as well. And um, why does it have the name vanilla leaf? Because it actually has this really sweet sort of vanilla scent. And apparently this can be dried and hung in your windows and it helps to keep away flies and just kind of smells nice and things like that but apparently a good natural bug repellent. Let's have a look at the leaves. So leaves of the vanilla leaf, um, got the three of them here, vaguely triangular in shape. So it comes out across the bottom up, a little bit more rounded than a triangle, I guess. And then scalloped with these big round sort of serration-y things around the outside, a little bit like the deer cabbage that we looked at earlier. Speaking of deer, another name for this plant is actually deerfoot. And because I guess some folks looked at the three leaves and thought that they looked like the toes of a deer's hoof, basically. So you can see a deer hoof has the two main ones there, and then the it's got two dew claws back here. But it's it's a bit of a stretch, you know, it's a bit of a stretch, but give them credit for imagination. Um, in a similar way, Vanilla leaf has the two bigger leaves here, though, and then kind of this one smaller leaf at the bottom there, I guess the dew leaf, like the dew claws here. Some of the reproductive structures. 
you've got the flowers occurring in this big cluster here. So these are all individual flowers, really hard to distinguish between them. This is called an inflorescence or a, a compound flower. And yeah, this big conical thing. Um, so these flowers will develop into, you know, kind of a nasty dried fruit called an akene. This isn't really, this isn't the fruit that you look forward to. This is, it's purely, purely reproduction. No, no pleasure of this one. But yeah, those are, those will occur later on and they tend to be sort of brownish to purplish in color. These are earlier in the season. These are what they look like later on in the season. Next group, we have our upright and leafies. A little bit harder to tell some of these apart. So first off, Indian helibor, Veratrum viridae. Isn't that a beautiful name, Veratrum viridae? <clears throat> so viridae refers to the fact that this is just this really lush green looking plant. And this is one, it's so, you know, it's such a lush green looking plant because it grows in really wet places. It takes a lot of moisture. You find this one oftentimes like right in creeks actually, or right beside creeks. But that can be kind of problematic because Indian helibor is notable because it is super, super toxic. So people, yeah, like a very small amount of this can kill or even harm you in some way. And it's actually been known to, it's been known to kind of poison water supplies that it grows in. So you gotta be, you gotta be really careful if you're, if you find this in the forest. This is one that you wanna know about really well. So how do we tell our, so let's have a look at the, the leaves of the, the Indian Gila borer versus some of the others. Big thing to note versus our other upright and leafies that we're gonna look at, check out the arrangement of the leaves. So they occur in this really, it's a really three dimensional looking plant. Look how the leaves stick out on all different sides of the stalk here. So they come out from every which way. This distinguishes it because a lot of the other plants, the, the leaves only occur on kind of on one side and it's a really two dimensional flat looking thing. Indian helibor though, really three dimensional looking plant. The leaves themselves, they can get quite large. Um, I think the biggest will be kind of like a small frisbee size, like maybe this big guy here will be like a tiny little frisbee. And then note the parallel venation once again. So the veins are, it's got those parallel veins that extend outwards. Having a look at some of the reproductive structures. Kind of, kind of cool looking flowers. So the flowers, so the, this is a type of inflorescence again, a type of compound flower. You've got all these little flowers here, you know, like big and big enough for you to kind of tell them apart, but not big enough to get a really good look at. And it's notable that they occur on these stalks that are really kind of drooping off all over the place. And so it's this, this big drippy branching flowery structure that occurs right at the top here. The little flowers themselves, you know, they're not really much to write home about. Um, yeah, you can see they've got kind of these green, these green petals. They're not really very showy, not showy flowers on this plant. What you can see in this photo, however, is all the fuzz on this thing. And so this is a really hairy plant. That's another thing, that's another way to identify it. You find this fuzz all over the place on your Indian helibor. Next up. False Solomon seal, Smilacina racemosa. <clears throat> um, some other, so some botanists actually call this Myanthemum racemosa. You might find it, you might see it referred to that in some books and some sources. And remember, Myanthemum is that's the same genus as our false lily of the valley that we talked about just a few minutes ago. So. You might see a few similarities there. The flowers on this one look pretty similar to the false lily of the valley. And the leaves also have the same kind of parallel veins, in the same vague shape. But purpose of this, of this course, this is gonna be Smilocene racemosa. That's the genus that we're gonna call it. Now, when I was trying to remember how to, when I was trying to remember this scientific name, it just made, <laughs> Like it just made me think about 
<clears throat> yeah, Smilacina Racemosa just made me think about mimosas all the time. And so that was that was really fun. And maybe you'll think about mimosas and false solemn in steel now as well. So having a better look at those leaves. Um got the parallel veins, kind of like the false lily of the valley. It's rounded at the bottom, so remember the false lily of the valley had those had those heart-shaped leaves. No, these ones are just rounded at the bottom. You can see it's got this it's got this very small little stem there that it's attached by. <clears throat> and um, note how the leaves poke out on either side of the stalk here, basically in one plane. So they got to come out on this side. They come out on that side. They don't come out forwards or backwards though. And that's a good way to tell this apart just from a distance from the Indian Gila board that you were looking at. Getting into the reproductive structures, first of all, have a look at these berries. Remember where we saw berries that looked a bit like this before? Yeah, the false lily of the valley. So the berries get kind of that, they look really speckly earlier in the season, and then later in the season, they turn into more of like a pure reddish color. Now the flowers that these berries develop from, they occur in this big kind of clumpy cluster at the end, it's just another one of those conical clusters of little tiny white flowers that are hard to tell apart. So not too exciting there. That occurs right on the end of the plant. Clasping twisted stalk. Kind of, uh, this is, if you're gonna get anything confused with your false salmon seal, this is probably gonna be it. Streptopopus and plexifolius. How fun is that name? Streptopopus amplexifolius. It sounds very kind of Harry Pottery. But what this amplexifolius, what that means, that literally translates either from Greek or Latin to mean twisted stalk. So one of those names that, another one of those great names that tells you what you're looking for. So here is the key to tell your clasping twisted stalk apart from your false Solomon steel. I got the goods here, guys. So check out, you might be wondering, clasping in the name, what does that refer to? That refers to the fact that the base of the leaf here is hugging or grabbing onto the stalk in the middle there. And note how, the, remember the false salmon seal was just rounded at the bottom and had a tiny little stem that the leaf was attached by. The, your clasping twisted stalk the leaf actually wraps right around and hugs the stem at the bottom there, and that's how it's attached. So that's a really great way to distinguish this. It makes it look really unique. The stalk itself, look how it's kinked and going off zigzag all over the place. So that's a way that you can potentially notice this plant from a distance. And this is a plant, you know, it doesn't get super, super big. So this will just for just for kind of for size comparison, this you might find this and it'll be about waist high in the forest, maybe a little bit bigger than that. But this isn't a massive, this isn't like a huge plant. Having a look at these leaves now, um, they look pretty, the leaves other than the base look pretty similar to the false Solomon seal. So the same kind of parallel veins, you can't really tell in this photo, but they are pointed at the tip as well. And here is another great way to tell this plant apart when you, when you have some flowers and you have some berries available. So remember, the false Solomon seal, the Indian helibore, actually most of the other plants that we've looked at, they have what's called a terminal inflorescence, which is just fancy botanical speak for the berries and the flowers occur in a big clump on the tip of the plant. Clasping twisted stalk, however, it likes to do its own thing. And so what it does is underneath each one of the leaves here, you'll have a single flower, which turns into a single berry growing out of the growing out of it there. And yeah, it looks really unique and it makes it look kind of like Christmas ornaments to me. So you've got just these single flowers and single berries popping out there. The flowers, kind of these funny white little ones, sort of like a bell shape, but then they come out more of the petals. And the berries, yeah, the berries look like that. And just a, so this is another photo that gives you a good size comparison for the plant here. See how big it is compared to this uh, person's hand. And you can really see the, you can see the berries poking out from the bottom there. 
unique little Christmassy plant. That's all we have for this group. All right, I look forward to seeing people in their lab section for review or go on to Patrick Colbert's website and quiz yourself on your own time. Have a good one.